Hello and welcome to World Cycling Productions video of the 83rd Tour de France. I'm Phil Liggett and it's great to be back with you as always. The Tour de France this year covered five countries. It covered a distance of 2,400 miles. It brought together 198 of the finest bike riders in the world. The route itself going first to the Alps, then going across to the west and down into the Pyrenees before a long time trial and the final journey home to Paris. And the rain is coming down again, just as it was when the race last started in Holland in nearby Leiden in 1978, but hopefully it won't be as heavy. Hertogenbosch, known to everybody as the Den Bosch, and the prologue distance is slightly over the regulations allowed by the UCI, but they've given dispensation for it today. And we're in the magic number 51, Evgeny Berzin here, out on the course. It's a shame the rain has come. It's not quite as heavy as it was when, in fact, the prologue time trial after it was run was cancelled and didn't count towards the overall classifications last uh, in, back in 1978. This waiting to start. Miguel Ingerain in his yellow jersey is five times the previous winner. Alex Zulit, second last year, waiting to start in the Brabenholler, while out on the course is Big Lance Armstrong, and his times are good. Evgeny Berzin now, he should set the new standard for them all to beat as he comes up towards the line. Chris Borman did a terrific, tremendous ride of 10.55, and he's gone better than Berzin. 10.56.43, Evgeny Berzin has gone one behind Borman. So the British rider who holds the prologue record at 34.3 kilometres an hour is still in the hot seat. Out on course, a rider who also crashed like Bourbon last year in saint brieuc Alex Zula. And Zula will take the risk as we now go back to the finish for the arrival of Tony Rominger. There's Borman's time. Rominger is well outside of it. He's taken no chances at all. Rominger only fourth at the moment and there's some big names still to finish. And none bigger than the last man out on the circuit, Miguel Ingerain. And I wonder whether he'll take any chances because approaching the finish now is the rider who's just started in front of him, Alex Zula. Zula has taken plenty of risks around these corners. He's been skimming off the tight the line through the barriers and Zula's time is going to beat Chris Borman. Borman is going to be knocked off the leader's pile with just two riders left to come in. Alex Zula, 10.53.84 is the leader. And here is the face of Big Big himself, up the gears. Now, Miguel's time has not been as good as Zula through the checkpoints out on the course, and so it's proving now as he approaches the finish. Miguel Indurain is not going to start tomorrow in yellow. He wears the yellow jersey today as last year's winner, 11.05 and only seventh place for Miguel Ingerain. That really is a little bit below par for him. There's the result, Borman losing two seconds, Berzin third. What a prologue, look at the names here. Alano fourth and Tony Rominger fifth. Well, it was a close finish. To be frank, I'm surprised it was that close. I thought I'd be a uh, third, maybe fourth. I was going OK down the straights, but as I said, there's no way I could take the risks on the, on the corners. Very frustrating, but you just have to make the decisions. And the opening stage will stay here, based in Den Bosch in Holland. But let's now have a look as we remind ourselves of the overall distance of the race and the fact that there are 198 starters. Let's have a look and see how we rank the contenders for the 1996 Tour de France. It's top marks in three of the five categories for Miguel Indurain. Occasionally, though, he has been left wanting in the mountains. And if his team is suspect, as we think it is, it could make him fallible in 1996. Laurent Jalabert's one advantage over Indurain is his immensely strong team. The man who gives the French hope is now the world number one ranked rider. He's a winner and he has a great confidence in himself. Tony Rominger equals Indurain in our points table because he has a strong team to back him. The Swiss superstar has also beaten Indurain in both mountains and time trial in recent years. At 35, it could be the last chance for him to claim the Spaniard scalp. Evgeny Berzin is weak on experience, having retired in this race last year. But he can ride well in the time trials and he can climb. If his team can back him, he could become the first Russian to win the race. Alex Zula is part of Laurent Jalabert's strong Anse team. The Swiss rider's second place overall in Paris last year has left him believing in himself and a great backup to the Frenchman. We give Chris Borman a low assessment because we feel winning is still beyond him. He's never finished the race. But the 27-year-old still promises so much. 
to survive the mountains could mean a high placing in Paris for him and make him a favour for the future. This year, yes, it is. It is the great unknown. And I'm trying to think of it as a challenge and not a problem. It's, it's, it's a long race, twice as long as anything I've ever done before. Uh, so a lot of people keep biting off a little bit more than I can chew out of their enthusiasm for somebody to, to get behind and support. And that's nice, it's what you call a nice problem to have, but uh, I feel that pressure. But for me, I mean, to take the yellow jersey yesterday would have been great, that would have been a little bit of insurance, but that's gone and that's life. Because yesterday I had to make the decision, am I here for three weeks or am I here for 10 minutes? And uh, I was definitely, I had to make the decision three weeks. So if I have one really good day in the mountains where I'm riding with the front group, and I come into Paris in the first 20, that for me would be progression. And I wouldn't say I'd be ecstatic with that, but I could be content with that, and it would be something to move on from from the future. And this opening stage is staying a base on the city of Den Bosch in the southeast of Holland. And the rider's very worried about the stage because they're always nervous. He's opening first days in the tour. When riders get uh, used to riding with one another, everybody believes they can win the stage and not surprisingly in Holland, the roads are flat and the riders believe that they have a real chance at striking out and getting a stage win. But the problem is the crashes and there we have it. Now there was a rider down on the right and it's the Spanish rider who finished 10th last year, Hernan Buenohora of the Kelme boy. He's in a precarious position there as he gets his bike off the road, but he does look as though he's quite badly injured with that right knee. And somebody else is down as well. Perhaps we can see it better here. The wind keeping the riders uh, pinned to the left-hand side of the road. And Buena Hora is shot out of the line over to the right. And there's another rider and a little bit of leapfrogging with the bikes over the broken machinery here. Oh, Paneri does a pretty good job at mountain riding. But that is a great shame, and that is about the second or third crash we've had already today. And Buena Hera uh, has been announced as having retired from the race with his injuries. And this is Tilly Marie. Now, this was a sort of central reservation here in the middle of the median strip. Marie has gone slamming into that sign. Tilly Marie, who has been a great prologue glider over the years in the Tour de France. He's won it three times. He's also had one of the longest breakaways ever, too, to win a stage and get the yellow jersey back, and he's in trouble. There's a little crash up the road, and I think there's somebody over to the right here, and that, to me, uh, looks like uh, Luc Leblanc, who has gone down on the right of the road here, and the doctor, Gérard Porte, is with Luc Leblanc. Let's have a look down. There's Tilly Marie going into the centre, and at the same time, there's a rider gone off to the left because another rider fell, and it seems to be a completely separate incident. Well, this is Luc Leblanc, and it looks like he's going on. Well, hats off to him because he looked as though he was down and out for the count there, Luc Leblanc. This is the race now as we head up towards the finish, and the riders are still clear of the field. There's a, the bunch is actually split in these crosswinds. And little Andre Schmil is trying to get in on the action. Leon Van Bon is leading it out for the Rabobank. There is Mario Cipollini in the champion of Italy shirt, green top. Also trying to get through is the white jersey of Frederic Moncassan. This is going to be a very tight finish indeed. Jerome Blyleven is pushing hard as well. That's Blyleven for TVM. And I think it is also Zabel who's trying to move over to the right, but he's dropped away from it. Frederic Moncassan and Blyleven's right on the line, and it's gone to Moncassan. What a start for the Gant team. They get the first stage win of this year's Tour de France. And that was a day for the sprint. In fact, it wasn't Zabel, it was Verada who was up there in third. Blyleven's gets second. Overall, Alex Zula keeps his lead after the prologue win by three seconds over Berzin and seven over Abraham Alano. And back in 1994, Frederick Moncassam, well, he fell off the presentation podium at the start of the tour, broke his ankle and was unable to start. This morning, Mario Kuma, a non-starter, after a broken collarbone yesterday. Now, at 17 kilometres to go, the riders cross from Belgium into France. Now, in Belgium, it is compulsory to wear a crash helmet when you are racing. But take one step into France, and it then becomes the rider's personal choice. But my advice, after the way Mario Cipollini was sprinting yesterday, is to keep these helmets on. And as the riders head in towards Vascal, we've completely traversed Belgium today without stopping, coming through from Holland, and we're just going across to the border town of Vascal. And TVM have now got control of the head of the peloton. They couldn't win with Bly Levens, a Dutchman in Holland. Perhaps they'll have better luck as they arrive in France. 
Frederick Moncassan heading up towards the yellow jersey with a six seconds bonus at the start of the first hotspot sprint today. Now, can he snatch any more at the finishing line as the riders break for the finish? It looks as though a late rush by Vyacheslav Yekimov is going to come to north as the sprinters all come up behind in the Saika boys trying to organise themselves for Cipollini. But look at this now, Moncassan has got himself in on the action. Mario Cipollini is trying to break away, but he's dropped back a little bit as Moncasan goes again on the left of our picture. And a strong attack, too, coming from Zabel. Eric Zabel, Mario Cipollini in the centre now. Blyleven's on the right. Cipollini's going to make it. Cipollini, Blyleven's over the line. And the third place, I think, was Jan Zarada in that green points jersey. And as we look down here, what an easy win for Mario Cipollini. So, the self-proclaimed fastest man in the world is back in a big way and we are only on to stage two of the Tour de France and the celebratory champagne is already being poured. This is the overall standings after two stages of racing now. Azula a second ahead of Moncassan. The battle for the bonuses will follow. Berzine is third as we move on now to stage number three and taking us down through France into nogent sur Alex Zula still in the leader's yellow jersey, but beginning to look a little bit fragile now as the challenge is coming from Frédéric Moncassin on these flat stages, chasing out the sprint bonuses. And Baldato is in the action there as well. He gets the first one at Douai after 43 kilometres. Blylevens and Zverada were the riders who snipped up the four seconds and two seconds bonus. Now, normally today it's the team time trial, but this year it's out of the tour. And here's Gary Imlach to tell us more. The look of the team time trial is that of a bunch of futuristic commuters sharing the workload on the way to the office. And at first glance, it's about as dramatic, but it does contribute its share of tour incident. Oh, there's been a crash here, and this is the this is a disaster for Ariostia. They were recording the best time without a shadow of a doubt. They've collided on that left-hand bend, and they've all gone down here. But I think Argentin and Rolf Sorensen have been lucky, and they've missed it. The rest of the team don't know what to do. Although he crashed in 1991, Rolf Sorensen's team had been pulling him along at such a good lick, he still managed to limp onto the podium to take yellow. In 94, it was the other way round. Chris Boardman's blazing individual speed secured the race lead. His team's collective lack of it let it slip. And that's been the criticism of the team time trial, but it has too much say in the individual standings. It certainly didn't do Tony Rominger any favours in 1993. He went into it 18 seconds behind Miguel Indurain came out of it down by nearly two minutes. Being penalised didn't help, neither did having only four teammates fit enough to finish. The biggest team time trial loser, though, was Stephen Roach in 1991, who turned up late to find his team had set off without him and ended up being eliminated. Still, he remains a big fan of the team stage, apparently on aesthetic grounds. Well, I think it's a bit unfortunate, really, for the, the spectacle of the Tour de France in itself, because I think the Tour de France is a very uh, beautiful event when you see the the riders all in harmony kind of it's uh, it's very difficult but it's a very spectacular spectacular event i think and it's a pity this year it's not in tour de france so why is it missing this year well it depends who in the tour organization you ask so qu'il faut pas il faut pas rester toujours avec les, les mêmes programmes les mêmes choses euh, fait au même endroit le, le tour de france fait pour, pour changer pour innover pour que les coureurs euh, perdent un petit peu leurs habitudes Et bien sûr, c'est ça qui fait aussi la, la beauté de la course. Je ne prends pas ça pour une innovation, c'est un regret. Car lorsque nous avons préparé le parcours du Tour 96, nous avions prévu un contre la montre par équipe au lac de Madine. C'est un très beau parcours. Et puis, vous savez que les règlements de l'UCI nous contraignent de faire le Tour de, jour, le tour de France pardon, dans 23 jours. And it was the team time trial that had to go. A move that's affected just who gets selected for the race. Ja, okay, now uh, muss ich misschien uh, mehr uh, Renners haben vor den Bergen und nicht vor den Zeitritten. Und, uh, gewohnt uh, Renners haben auf zwei in der Plug vor den Zeitritten uh, individual und nicht vor den Plugenzeitritten. Es ist misschien mooi ein Kier, in so einem Tour sonder Plugenzeitritten, aber in den folgenden Jahren sollte es auch besser sein mit dem Plugenzeitritten. Not that he'd admit it, but the man who stands to gain most from the absence of the team stage is the race's outstanding individual. If there was a team time trial this year, Indy would have found himself very, very far behind before the, the mountains next week. Because they honestly have a, an incredible team for a team time trial, contrary to the Vanessa team of Miguel Indy 
And the Stephen Roach used to race on the Carrera team. He won't be too happy with the news today that Enrico Zaina, also of Carrera and second in the Giro d'Italia, has retired on the road today towards Nogent. The race are now arriving there. There's been breakaways all day, but they've all been brought back now. And the sprinters, once again, are going to have their chance. And licking their lips are the Seiko riders after the success yesterday of Mario Cipollini. But the attacks are starting to come that might well spoil the party here. If Frederick Monkerson can snatch a bonus in the first three, then he should take the leader's yellow jersey away from Alex Zula. None of the big stars apart from Jan Zorada have been snatching points at the interim sprints along the road today because a breakaway midway through swept up all of the bonus times that really mattered. And now there he is, a three run back from the Saika boys in the green top of his jersey, little Andre Schmiel. Moncassan is also pushing in. He's got the right wheel there behind Mario Cipollini in the white Moncassan. Now the riders are supposed to swing off when you lead out a man, not just free wheel. The Saika boy almost stopped the race there as he didn't move away from the front. But I'm not too sure whether Cipollini's come too late here. His team have run out of steam as Eric Zabel goes on the left of our picture. And I think they've not given Cipollini a good lead out at all here. Zabel is digging deep. Jan Zarada is coming. He looks as though he's sold at the moment. Flylevens is out of it. Moncasan might just have got third place there. And if he did, let's have a look at this. He will be in yellow tonight. Eric Zabel gets an early stage win. He got two last year. This time it's an early win for him. Cipollini was gaining on him, but not quick enough. And indeed, Frederic Moncasan did get third place. Rada fourth. Look at those sprinters all lined up there. But this one was the fastest of the day. Eric Zabel of Germany and the telecom team. And he's going to be a favourite now for that green points jersey. Overall, though, Frederic Moncasan is the new leader of the tour. The bonus giving him a seven seconds advantage and ten over Evgeny Berzin. There he is. What a dream start for Frederic Moncasan. First of all, the stage win and now the Mayo Jean. As we move on to stage number four, we move away from Soissons, heading to the Lac de Madine. No real hills on the contour, and this man won't care anyway, because these are the nice moments of the Tour de France of Frédéric Moncassin, and I think he might require that yellow jersey back for today's stage. Leaving under clear blue skies, here's the champion of France, having won his title just before the start of the Tour, Stéphane Erlo, also had a great ride, fourth place in the recent Dauphiné Libre. And a former champion of France there, Serge Boucherey, telling Stefan if he keeps this up, he's going to be the new leader of the tour. And I don't think Moncassin will mind because Erlo also on the same GAN team. A little bit of hard work being done here by Injurain. No, not Miguel, but brother Prudencio is riding extremely well this year. And this is Herminio Diaz Zabala. Now these are trying to get some inroad into this leading breakaway, which contains Danny Nelson, number 86 here, Stefan Erlo, champion of France at the front, Cyril Sogran at the back in yellow, Rolf Yerman of the MG team, he's second from the end in our picture, and Mariano Piccoli, king of the mountains in the Tour of Italy. These are the riders who are in the escape that has got clear and has gained a lot of time. Now you can't let a rider like Erlo go too far because he is a climber, as he showed us in the Dauphiné Libre, and the field are trying to chase down and reduce that big gap at the one kilometer banner there's no way now they're going to get up onto the onto the situation here they're going to come in quite a few minutes down anyway but this is a marvelous piece of riding and Erlo starting the day the best place of the team by a long way just 43 seconds off the Mayo Jean of his teammate Frederic Moncassin so Erlo knows already he's going to be the new yellow jersey the first time in his career as it is newcomer Cyril Sogran of the Aubervilliers team who leads out. I tell you what, if he gets this one, this is going to vindicate the organisation for allowing this young French team into the event. And I'm quite sure there'll be a big smile on the face of Jean-Marie Leblanc. And it looks as though Cyril Sogran's going to have the greatest moment of his life. Nelson, I'm not surprised and annoyed. The amateur world champion will take only second place. Cyril Sogran gets the stage win. What a surprise surprising tour this is already turning out to be he could never have possibly have dreamt of this happening to him the breakaway has worked and he has been proven to have the best sprint there's the clock counting down the time gap the arrival of the Mayo Jean now passing across to his teammate Erlo the green jersey also of Jan Zorada Zorada's gone down he clipped the back wheel the two riders from Gann looked over Bjorn Ries is on the barriers there he was lucky to miss it you can see the champion of Denmark far left as it just a touch of wheels there and it looked to be totally the fault of Jan Zorada that's Paulo Lauren Brochard who's gone skydiving over the top of Zverada and the grit of the teeth of the Danish champion Reese. He was lucky to stay upright. 
Thank heavens for the barriers, which is more than you could say for Abdu Japarov a few years ago when he hit them at the finish of a stage in Paris. And so there's the result. Sirio Sogran getting the victory over Nelson. The main field coming in almost five minutes back. And Yumai Ojean yet again. Now it's on the shoulders of Stefan Erlo by 22 seconds over Piccoli. The men of that breakaway taking the top five places overall. This is where the rest are standing right now. As we move on to stage number five, heading on now to Besançon, what a dream start for the Gann team who have had so much success. And Stéphane Erlo, the first Breton, that's the northern part of France, to wear the maillot jaune since 1992, when it was worn by Pascal Lino. Well, among the non-starters this morning, Mario Cipollini, the champion of Italy, has chosen not to start. He says he's feeling unwell. There are others who are saying he's going away to prepare especially for the Olympic Games in Atlanta. Southwesterly winds and cloudy today and rather chilly 18 degrees Celsius. And the whole field compact as they roll away. No real challenges on the road today, a couple of small hills, and there's a crash down there, and look at the way the peloton has spread round in a big circle, crossing a narrow bridge, and this is another bit of confusion, riders falling, as there have been daily in this race, uh, taking out one or two of the stars as well, and in fact, it looks as though Lance Armstrong is unhappy with Gilles Bouvard and Lotto, I tell you what, uh, disqualification is imminent, that's the first offence for fighting if the referees decide to apply it, and Bouvard of Lotto, apparently blamed by Lance there for the crash. This is Fagnini, who I think has got himself uh, a damaged collarbone there and may well be out of the tour, but the race goes on and the cloudy conditions have given way to sunshine as we approach the finish, heading up towards Besançon. And the Telecom boys now feeling they have a chance to get a few more points in the hat for Eric Zabel because among the riders who have abandoned uh, since that crash, Jan Zarada, who really didn't recover from that fall yesterday, has not finished the stage. He has gone wearing the green jersey for Paneria. And so that now means that Zabel has a real chance of pulling on the green jersey, but not before there's an attack. It looked like Leon van Bonn who went, and he's an opportunist who won a stage this year with a similar move near the finish. But that's not Van Bon, that's Ekimov. Ekimov, the, another opportunist who likes to fly in the last couple of kilometres, as he used to do when he was a Soviet Union rider on the track. Broke world record after world record alone against the watch, and he still has a fine turn of speed in those legs, but not to hold off the whole of the Tour de France today. As the riders come together, even Bjorn Aris is getting in on the action here, a non-sprinter as he's trying to find a way through for Eric Zabel. The champion of Denmark for the second year in succession. And Frederick Monkasan has taken off his wheel. There he goes. Monkasan in the green jersey. More points for him, perhaps. Jerome Vlyle, which is coming on the left. This is going to be very close. He makes it look easy. He won at Dunkirk last year. Vlyle has now got his victory here in Besançon. And there is the confirmation. Monkasan, Zabel, Travassoni, Abdu, Japarov and Ferragato in that order over the line. So, a great result. Let's join Paul Sherwin at the finish. That was a very well-judged sprint at the end. It looked as if Monkasan was going to get it to begin with. Yeah, today I took uh, the good wheel. The first day I was out of bad wheels and I had not so luck. But today I had uh, a lot of luck and I won. You need both as a sprinter, but this rider wasn't too worried about the result of the sprint. Stefan Erlo keeping his overall yellow jersey by that same 20 seconds, and that breakaway still surviving in the top five places. Alex Zula, birthday today. He wallows four minutes, five seconds off yellow. Uh, the happy days when he started in yellow um, in his first Tour de France, they've gone now. Heading on from Arc et Senon down to Aix-les-Bains, 128.6 miles today, and it'll be the 20th time we'll have arrived at Aix-les-Bains. People like Eddie Merckx and Greg LeMond have won here, and also Dmitry Konishev, who won in 1991. But returning to this year's Tour de France, here's a sad sight, as we now see Lance Armstrong in heavy, heavy rain. He has complained of a sore throat and it looks as though he's decided to call it quits. Well, this is amazing, but the Tour de France, which only started today on the stage six with 181 riders, has now lost Alexander Gonchenkov. He was a non-starter this morning. We're now seeing the goodbye here of Lance Armstrong. And uh, that is very, very sad indeed, not just for Armstrong, but also for Motorola, because they are now something of a headless team without their team captain. 
They have riders individually for stage wins, but they don't have anybody really for a high overall finish, except perhaps Laurent Madwas. And no, we don't need the race conditions, do we? Just look at them. Torrential rain and flood water reported on the roads as the riders get down to the finish at aix les bains They are all more or less huddled together. And hardly for comfort, warnings again of obstacles in the centre of the road. This time it's the Onse team sending the signals. A matter of self-survival here by the professionals of the Tour de France. A race which has been battered by the crashes every day. And now we have an attack here. And again it comes from the Rabobank. And it's Michael Bogart. Well, you have to be Dutch, I think, to break away in these conditions and take all the risks because they are such good bike handlers. And Bogart has ridden away from the peloton here simply by breaking that little bit later on these very, very dangerous corners. And I wonder if he's going to hang on because they're coming at him in a big rush here. It's going to be a tight finish as Zabel is trying to catch him, but it's all too late. Zabel will have to be content with second this time as Michael Bogart takes his very first stage in, in a Tour de France, and even in these conditions, can he afford to smile? So the result, uh, Bogart getting it for Rabobank, Zabel second, Jalabert coming in the frame for the first time this year. He is in third place, so last year's green jersey may be a challenger yet. Happy birthday to Alex Zula, he's 28, he climbs up to third overall. We're now on day eight. The overall race leader this morning, as the riders set out from Chambry, is the Frenchman Stefan Erlot. But the big names today will try to challenge because we're now in the Alps. The riders come up the climb of the Col de la Madeleine, the first all-category climb of the Tour. That means it's a major mountain. But you know, the weather has been the talking point. Yesterday, they finished in torrential rain. Today, they say the temperatures will plummet to just 5 degrees Celsius. And there could even be snow on the top of the Col de la Madeleine. Without more ado, let's get to the action. And just a reminder, yes, it's supposed to be summer in France in the month of July. Uh, just a shaving under 200 kilometres, 124 miles the race today. This is a reminder of the overall situation. A 20-second gap to Piccoli, having a good Tour de France, as he did Tour de Tour of Italy. Alex Zula, the big challenger in third, and the return of Laurent Jalabert now. He is up to fourth. Further down the list, Abraham Olano, the world champion on the road race, he's in sixth place. And this is the situation as the riders come over the top of the Col de la Madeleine. Well, there is no snow, but there is very, very poor visibility. And all the way up, of the, up the climb, the yellow jersey has been in trouble. He's gone over the top a minute and 11 seconds down, Stefan Erlo. As the riders here, this is a, another group over four and a half minutes down. This first day in the mountains has done an awful lot of damage. Now, look at these conditions here. There's moisture on our camera lens as well. We can't do anything about that. Valentino Foy, what a lucky man he is. He's gone off the road on the descent and he's chosen a stretch of the mountain where he doesn't go downhill too quickly. He looks OK as he comes back up to the roadside. As we go back up to the leaders here, and it's the big MIG himself now. He hates weather like this. You can see him well wrapped up. He's got warm gloves on there. And Miguel Ingerain will be feeling reasonably happy with the way things are going. He's got control of the front of the pace. If you don't like the day, you don't like the climbs, then try and get to the front and ride them at your pace and keep everybody behind you. That's his attitude on his shoulder, is Alex Zula. Number 181 here, the Kelme rider, is Fernando Escartin. And number 14 is Eitor Gomendia. A very select little group, Abraham Olano, the world champion, far right of our picture. And the new champion of Spain, the Fernandez Gines, is sitting at the back of this very, very select group. Gone is the Mayo Jorn and still lingering behind the race, and he's certainly out of the hunt now. We really did expect Stefan Erlo today to be up uh, with a group of this size because he certainly is an above average climber and I think he has a problem with his right knee which he has been complaining about. A sad sight for Great Britain because Chris Bourbon has also uh, been dropped off the back on the climb of the Col de la Madeleine. He too is quite a way down and learning perhaps the realities of the Tour de France because Chris is yet to finish the Tour. He may hold the record for the fastest prologue ever, but he also holds the other record for the fastest exit ever, which he did last year in the prologue when he crashed after about a mile. A brave soldier have come up onto the climb of the Cormier de Roseland, which has come after 163 kilometres. An attack there by Bjorn Ries, champion of Denmark, but not so at the back of the race, because I think there is the odd tear in the eyes there of Stefan Erlo. 
Three days in the Maillot Jaune in his first Tour de France, and the way he's riding there, I think it's all over for him. Well, they brought back Bjorn Aris. Aris had a meeting in November with his team and promised them he could win the Tour. The majority of the meeting have laughed so far, but you know, he does look to have good form. If they believe in Reese and give him the support, who knows? Laurent Dufault. And Dufault, in fact, a minute 15 behind, the leader on the road, Bolt. But look at this man, he was the leader of the Tour de France. He has signaled to his team car, it's all over. Well, I think, uh, by my reckoning, he is only the 12th man to leave the Tour de France wearing the Maillot Jaune and Stéphane Hello, He does have a problem, I think his tendonitis in his right knee. He is out of the Tour and that is very, very sad. We're back up at the front now and Dufault has in fact joined, uh, not joined, but passed Udo Bolt, the attacking rider, who went clear on the climb of the Cormet de Roselaine. He has now been caught and dropped as we've gone over the top of the Borg, uh, of the Prima Borg Saint Maurice. And now Laurent Dufault is going to make a bid. As we join the rather narrow roads here on the descents that are bound, but at least the sun has come out. There's some very, very difficult descents on the Cormet de Roselaine. Oh my goodness me! And that uh, is a rider from Rabobank who has gone clean off into this ravine here on the descent of the Cormet de Roseland. And in fact, it is Johan Brunil who has gone down, but he looks perfectly okay. What a shock. And in fact, can you believe this? This man is just looking for another bike. I doubt whether they'll get the other one back. And there it is, uh, Johan Brunil who's having a great ride. He was with the main chase group on the mountain. Straight back into the fray and hardly a look backwards. Absolutely amazing. This is Laurent Dufault, the leader on the road now of the Tour de France. The sun is out. Perhaps this will help Miguel Indurain. He's a little bit like a lizard. He needs plenty of sun to warm up for the action. Tony Rominger right behind him. The far side of him there was Alex Zula. And now the message coming to Laurent Dufault. He has a real chance here on the climb up towards Les Arcs. First ever time the Tour has finished at Les Arcs, which always surprises me. We're in the parallel uh, valley to Val Torrance, where we've been before. As the attacks are now trying to come away from the main field here. But you know, the leaders have got themselves together today. They've just tested one another out, but they've kept themselves basically together. Uh, that's Luc Leblanc, who seems to be moving up for an attack. He's gone straight up to the front, and Luc Leblanc going clear. This little man, a very ungainly style on a bike, but he is a very star climber indeed. Won the stage of the Tour at Otakam back in 1994. Most consistent Tour de France rider. Has only worn the yellow jersey for one occasion only. He did it back in 1991. But he finished fourth in 94. Now he's back, having missed last year when the Groupement disbanded the team. He's gone straight by Laurent Dufault, and there was no fight left in Dufault. I think he really did hit the wall. He didn't look too good when he was chatting there with his team manager. And the pace, no real reaction here. No suicide runs on this first day in the Alps. Indurain looking good at the front. The Spanish flag, or rather the Belgian flag there, being shown to a Swiss rider, and a counter-attack here. Now here's a man that everybody already is beginning to talk about, and this is the rider from the Carrera squad, Lutenberger. First Tour de France for him, I saw him race in South Africa as an amateur. He's a superb climber. He's gone straight up to the side of Richard Berenko, who rather Richard Berenko has come up behind Lutenberger, and because he doesn't want him to get too much of a lead, Leblanc is the man on the attack, and we often see that whenever a Frenchman attacks, a Varenk is likely to follow. He likes to be the number one Frenchman. He's been the winner of the King of the Mountains for the last two years. And by the way, the King of the Mountains today has been well dropped at Leon Van Bon. As Luc Leblanc heads up towards the finish at Les Arcs, ironically now in the sun, what a day this has turned out to be. The King of the Mountains has been dropped. We have seen the yellow jersey abandoned. We've known one bad crash uh, to Johan Brunil, who has climbed back on his bike. And now we're heading up towards the finish here, and the race is beginning to fragment. Alex Zula, now 28 years of age, as we head up towards the 32nd birthday of Miguel Indurain, and that's Zula and Indurain. Indurain has been dropped here. 
This is not the going forward part of the group. This is the going backward part of the group. Miguel Indurain has been passed by Alex Zula. Indurain is in trouble, and that is something we have never seen during the last five tours. Miguel Indurain is in trouble here. He's being tailed off by Zula. There are plenty of riders ahead, and in fact, he has called for a drink. Now, it's not allowed to accept a drink at this stage of the race under the race regulations. If he takes anything, he will be fined. He'll get a small time penalty. I think the first offence is 10 seconds. And in fact, uh, the drink offered there by, it wasn't from his team car. He took one look at it and threw it away. So maybe the referees will turn a blind eye on that. As we go up to the leader, the man here who is setting the pace, he will not know the drama that's going on behind him. We have actually seen uh, Miguel Indurain crack on a mountain stage. Maybe the weather really did get to him. But Luc Leblanc is stamping on those pedals and heading up towards the finish now at Les Arc. And he's, he's going to win the stage just like he did at Otakam. This is going to be a great return for Luc Leblanc. And he would have been so high up the overall classification, but for that first aid crash, when we saw him lying on the right-hand side of the road, it really did look on that first day that his Tour de France was over. It's turned right around now. Luc Leblanc comes to the line and takes the great victory at Les Arc. And he comes up. Punches the sky. So Leblanc is back. He's gaining time too on an awful lot of riders. The second man up the climb now. As he punches the pedals. In fact, if Dufault was hanging on there, he's only just been caught inside the line. Tony Rominger is the rider who's gone through. And Richard Varenk is up behind his teammate, teammate Laurent Dufault, but it's going to be another surprise. Tony Rominger is going to get second place. Around about 45 seconds behind Luc Leblanc. Rominger gets second. And that will give him a good morale for the rest of the race. Uh, getting second in the mountains first day out. Luterberger gets the third slice. Ferenc is fourth. Dufault hung on, hung on for fifth. And Abraham Olano gets sixth. But here's the story of the day. They've all crossed the line on top of the mountain, including now the pink jersey of Alex Azula. While behind, we have Miguel Indurain in all sorts of... Look at the clock. Three and a half minutes to Zula. And it's still counting to Miguel Indurain. You know, this man could have lost the Tour de France on this one bad day in the Alps. He's clearly hit the wall. He's been unhappy with the weather. The weather has been atrocious, but it's come good here at Les Arcs. Maybe he's finished up with too many clothes on. He's hyperventilated, but whatever the reason, Miguel Indurain today appears human, and he's never done that for the past six years of the Tour de France. Five times a winner since 1991, he is going to cross the line. Over four minutes behind the winner, he has conceded an awful lot today. Miguel Indurain, his sixth Tour de France, you've got to say it, is now in serious doubt, and I'm not surprised that Luc Leblanc is ecstatic. So LeBlanc, no yellow jersey yet for him, but look at this, Laurent Jalabert even further behind than Miguel Indurain and not looking at all well. And the arrival too of Chris Boardman, he's also finished off the back, and what on earth has happened? And then I just completely blew for no apparent reason, I've been eating plenty, weight's been stable, I just completely blew, and you can see it in pulse, 150 maximum I was riding at instead of 170 or 180, and... Uh, when that happens, then it's just finished. So I really crawled up the uh, the, um, the second climb with uh, Prudencio Injuran, Injuran, but the wrong one. <laughs> and uh, the last climb, we just rode up. I mean, it's you know half an hour, 35 minutes. It's it's neither here nor there. When it's oh. finished, it's finished. I mean, you, you said you blew. How bad did you feel? Well, how far was it down? <laughs> At the end, 20, 20 odd minutes, but I mean, Indurain lost four, Jalabert lost 18. Oh, yeah. it's, it's obviously been a hard day for a lot yeah, of people. Yeah, yeah. Um, to be honest, if it's 20 odd minutes, I'm absolutely gobsmacked. It's only that, you know, the way we were riding for the final. So it's, you know, it's not finished. I said I'm going to Paris and it's going to take more than today to stop me. It was an incredibly hard day and so many friends uh, on the route today, especially the last climb. When you're going well, there's nothing better than having friends there. It makes it a real euphoric experience. When you're going bad, there's nothing worse. Did, did you recover towards the end of the stage? Because when you came in, you seemed fine. That's because we didn't do the last climb uh, flat out. We rode it real steady the last climb. 
because it's a bit of a cliche, it's a court, you know, it's a race of three weeks and uh, today's one, one day. So if I was finished today, as I say, I lose half an hour, lose 35 minutes, it's, it's right here, neither here nor there. And, and no thoughts of um, your future in the Tour? Well, I'll uh, have a good look at the, uh, the classment tonight, um, have a good think about tomorrow, I'll speak with the boss. I'm really, really, really disappointed. I can't think of a worse day on a bike than I've had today. Uh, but I'm just, I just have to get over it. As I'm sure Chris Bourbon will, but the Tour de France really is a tough event. That is the stage result, and what a sensational day. Romy are getting second, Lutenberg a third, but the big news, of course, the demise of Miguel Indurain, as Luc Leblanc here waves to the crowd. Overall, Olano in a similar situation to he was in the Giro. Tied on time here with another Russian, this time Evgeny Berzin. And it is Berzin now who's fulfilling his promise and looks like becoming a real threat in this year's Tour de France as he gets his first maillot jaune and pulls it on. I'm not surprised it's long sleeves either. It's still very, very chilly on the Tour de France. And the King of the Mountains, a traditional wearer of the jersey this, Richard Berenk, who's now in the hot seat again. But there was no hiding, you know, for Miguel Indurain as Gary Imlac went in search of him on the eve of the time trial, which would take us to Val d'Isere. 159 rides at the start, 39 have now abandoned, and the man in trouble, well, there's no doubt who that was, Miguel Indurain. Imlac went to his hotel, and he found it was the same hotel as many of the top names. It wasn't the best piece of advance booking as far as Bernesto were concerned, especially as all the teams were lumped together in one dining room. But as first Berzin and then Rominger turned up to date their places at the table, there was no sign of the man whose place they were trying to take in the race. And after a couple of false alarms turned out to be brother Prudencio and second placed Abraham Alano, it became clear that Mig had opted for room service, probably delivered intravenously. Rominger, though, at least, was taking no pleasure in the great man's fallibility. Paul, look, I'm not a big favourite for the Tour de France. It's still other guys who can win the Tour de France. You know, you saw today in three kilometers you can lose three minutes. That can also happen to me. Finally, Mig materialized to face the press conference mics and admitted that the weather was giving him problems. Afterwards, though, he played down to us the extent of his suffering on the stage. No, the etapa ha ido bien. Durante toda la etapa ha ido bien y tenía intención hasta de atacar al final. Pero eso me ha venido de repente y ahí es sufrir no porque no tenía fuerzas para, para poder sufrir mucho sino intentar coger el ritmo y llegar hasta arriba hasta meta how much of his strength he's regained we'll obviously find out today but although Indurain may have made the tour less of a foregone conclusion on the evidence of last night he's determined that when it comes the conclusion itself will be the usual one and Gary Imlac may well be right because few people believe they've seen the last of Miguel Indurain not with his reputation here he is on the start line at Borg San Maurice he now lies 14 to 3 minutes 32 seconds behind the new leader, Evgena Berzin of Russia. Chris Borbman is setting the trend. He's just caught Emilio Diaz Zabella. And he is now the fastest rider at the 24 kilometers check. But of course, there are the other leaders of the tour are still to make their start. The arrival now of Chris Borbman. And this will be the best time thus far as Borbman crosses the line. His time of 54 minutes and 23 seconds, so the great British time trialist is living up to his reputation uh, yet again. And out on the course, now let's have a look at the 13 riders behind Indurain, but he's got the best time, six seconds better than Chris Boardman. But Boardman's at the finish, and you know he should be pleased with his ride. Yeah, I wanted to give it a good go so I could... Uh, Merci pour le direct. <laughs> so I could... Uh, <coughs> see where I stand against the others. Uh, I rode very con consistent right the way through. Not my better, but not the best I can be, but uh, I was happy that it was constant all the way through and I had a good sprint uh, at the end there. So uh, uh, <coughs> if I'm in the top five, I'll be relatively happy. Well, back out on the road here, Bjarne Rees of Denmark who is a rider who has had in the past very high finishes, fifth in 1993, the first real time we heard of him. And again, the champion of Denmark. He's doing good checkpoint times, but so too is this man, Miguel Indurain. Reese is behind Indurain. Indurain is now the new marker, and I never thought I'd say that. He's usually the man that sets the mark that nobody will beat, but because of his early start today, he will have to wait and find out if others are going as well. Look at this now. 
In Jermaine, it's 36 seconds quicker than the marks being set or have been set by Chris Boardman. Tony Rominger lower down the slopes. The actual climb of Val d'Isere doesn't start early on. The roads drag a little bit and then it goes up. Intermediate time at 9.3 kilometres. Jan Ulrich is beginning to throw a spanner in the works here. Gone through seven seconds quicker than Miguel Ingerain. Ulrich in his first tour. He's only a youngster on the telecom team and that is a big surprise. Well, here comes Alex Zula. And already he's slower than Miguel Ingerain and approaching the time of Bourbon. He slots in in second place behind Big Mig at the 15.7 kilometre check. So perhaps Ingerain has recovered overnight. He said his tour wasn't over at his press conference. Laurent Jalabert, though, well, maybe his tour is. Look at these times for Jalabert. If he really did have thoughts on a yellow jersey in Paris, they're fading fast now. Only 14th, 57 minutes and 49 seconds at the finish for Jalabert. Out on the course, they're all through the first check. Berzin, the leader, has got the best time. That's what he would want. 16 seconds to Ulrich and Alano. 18 seconds in third. Rominger is fourth. That's at the check at 9.3 kilometres. That's the easy bit of the course. Tony Rominger there. Now we're back to the walls to finish here as Miguel Ingerain is face a picture of pain. Trying to prove to himself, above all, that he is coming back into the frame. He's going to be fastest when he reaches the line. He has made good time over Boardman over this serious part of the climb. Interval is a best time for Ingerain, a 52-54, almost one and a half minutes quicker than Boardman. Sweeping up out on the course, Evgeny Berzin, the man in yellow. Look at the crowd here. It has been freezing cold standing on the slopes of this mountain today. Yet all of these people have waited to catch a glimpse of the new Mayu Jean of the tour. Evgeny Berzin, just 30 and a half kilometres, but what a painful run it is. Jan Ulrich now. 25 seconds off the lead. And this is a rider who is turning in one of the big surprises of the tour. He has stayed well to the line. He is just going to be slower than Ingerain. His time as he comes up to the line. Now arriving Lutenberger, who's already come in. He's got second. Ulrich is now second. Ingerain is still the leader. Ulrich down by only six seconds on Miguel Ingerain. Bjorn Aris. Well, Reese might have a problem on his hands and he may not realise it, coming from his own teammate, Jan Ulrich, who has turned in such a great time trial. Now, what about Reese? He's also approaching the time of injury. This looks like it might be a great start for Reese. He is going to take a lot of encouragement from the fact that injury dropped yesterday and now Bjorn Reese is in. His time is 52.28. He is 26 better, 26 seconds better than Miguel Ingerain. So Bjorn Aris is a serious tour contender this year. There's no doubt about that now. Tony Rominger, who needs a good ride today, but it doesn't look as though it's coming. 52 seconds off the pace at 24 kilometres. Rominger, who went to the United States in the Tour du Pont, where he trained specifically for the Tour de France. He has concentrated on this race this year, and I'm not so sure that the legs are performing quite as he wanted them to. Injure now down to second behind Reese as Rominger comes up to the line. He is going to be very close to the time of Injure as the line approaches. He will finish in 52.54 for Rominger. And I make that the same time as Miguel Indurain, but it'll be split by fractions of a second. The world champion, second in the world championship time trial behind Indurain, Alano. Again, is running close to the man who beat him to the rainbow jersey in Colombia. And Indurain's time, 52-54. Alano will beat him this time, 52-38 by just 10 seconds. Now, Evgeny Berzin, the only man left to finish here. Is he going to take it out with the best possible answer? The Mayo Jean winning at the time trial stage of the Tour de France. And that will take him on into the mountains tomorrow. The first really big hard climbs of this tour. They're all waiting literally over the hill here. As Berzin comes to the line, it's going to be the best time and it's going to be a great time for Evgeny Berzin. He pushes the time of Bjorn Aris. He is going to be the only man inside. 52 minutes, he does it. 51-53, 35 seconds better than Bjorn Aris of Denmark.
And we look down on the beautiful ski station of Val d'Azur. Well, it's normally beautiful anyway, but we're still waiting for the sun. Let's have a look at this result. Evgeny Berzin of Russia and Gay Wiz gets the win ahead of Bjarne Ries of Denmark. Abraham Olano is third. Miguel Injurain, is he on the way back? Same time as Rominger, finishing fifth. Overall, the leader of the tour increases his overall lead to 43 seconds over Bjarne Ries. What a day. Well, the weather has closed in, the rain coming, thank heavens, after the race had finished. But over my shoulder is the giant climb of the Col de Liseron. That's the way for the Tour de France tomorrow into the finish of Sestriere in Italy. The forecast is not good. This is turning out to be an amazing Tour de France. Well, this is what the Tour de France used to be like in the good old days. The riders enjoying hot sunshine, the crowds enjoying their day out and watching a great free spectacle. But not today, because all of the fears have been realised. The Col de Galibier is being swept by what the French are describing as a veritable tempest, with winds blowing up to 70 miles an hour. The riders cannot possibly cross over the mountain. In fact, I've spoken to one or two club cyclists who did try to come up here, and literally, they've been suffering for hypothermia on the descent. Richard Varenk heading to sign on, knowing he's going to sign on and step into a motor car, because the decision has been taken to cancel the Col de Galibier and the Col de Liseron, and instead the riders taken to the other side of the Alps, to the town of Le Monentier les bains where the race stage will now only be 46 kilometres, and it's going to last about one hour and ten minutes. But you know, when you have short stages, you often have difficult ones. At Sestria, let's remind ourselves of 1952. Fausto Coppi having a great tour this year. He also won at Alpe d'Huez, uh, which is not too far away, also in the Alps. But they're in the French Alps, Sestria in the Italian Alps. And just uh, a couple of years ago, in 1992, this was the arrival of the great Claudio Chiapucci after a fantastic escape over the mountains watched throughout the day on television. But as we join the action now, we are on the climb of Mont Ginevra, a second category climb coming straight after the start. I'm sorry about the quality of the pictures, but our helicopters have actually had difficulty in getting round the Alps to bring us any pictures at all because of the poor weather conditions. But the attack on the climb of Mont Ginevra has come from Bjarne Ries of Denmark, and as I said earlier, 46 kilometres is not a long way, but you know, when it's a short distance, it's a matter of pure strength. And Bjarne Ries has decided to go for gold right from the gun today. And what is happening here is that nobody is willing to help the yellow jersey of Evgeny Berzin. Abraham Olano is just behind him and not assisting in the pace at all. Richard Varenka, Escartin. Miguel Ingerain is up in the move again, which is nice to see. Ten kilometres to the summit now. We've moved on to the lower slopes of Sestria, and still we're waiting to see anybody take up the race here and help Berzin. He's finding the pressures of having a yellow jersey on his shoulder now rather hard. Well, Bjarne restarted the day 43 seconds away from yellow. The last time check we got, his lead was up to 50 seconds. If he continues this progress, there's no time bonuses now at the finishing line. It means he would indeed be the yellow jersey. I think, you know, Berzin sat up there as if he to say, I've had enough of this, you either help me or we'll all lose the race. And I think that's the answer because he's got back in the saddle. I thought he was blowing up, but he's got back in and fallen in behind Abraham Olano. But the speed here now of Bjorn Arisa being driven on by the thought he could be in yellow. That would be a great triumph for the Danish champion as well. He's under the five kilometres banner now. So Rees is a rider who knows he's on a mission. He promised his team he would do his best to win the Tour de France if they gave him a 100% commitment. They did, and now it's down to him. 49 seconds the gap. So it's holding. At the moment, he's in yellow by six seconds. Evgeny Berzin hasn't lost it yet, because normally one goes quicker towards the finish. They're under the five-kilometre banner. Olano now having to help Berzin, because he's realised the danger of the great escape here by the Danish rider. Rees, who came to his first Tour de France in 1989, we didn't really notice him. He finished 95th overall. He never finished the Tour in 1990, and he was 107th in 1991 and then his whole career changed direction he missed the tour in 92 when he came back in 1993 he won a stage he was briefly the king of the mountains leader 
and he also finished fifth overall. And right now he's in search of a yellow jersey yet again. He's worn it once before in 1995. Well, this is a defiant ride by Rees. Once that stage took out the two big mountains, because you know, on the eve of this stage, riders like Richard Brink were saying to everybody, the Tour de France would be decided today over the two big mountains of the Tour. But they didn't know that the snow would say otherwise. And this is my 24th Tour de France, and I have never seen snow falling on the cols in any of those 24 years. And Berzin feeling the pressures of the day. The Maillot Jaune, everybody wants it, and when you've got it, everybody can't keep it. Berzin having to set the tempo. Olano has gone back into second place. Lutenberger, by the way, in there, I've just spoken of him, there he is, he's putting an attack. Lutenberger, the climber from Austria, the Austrians are expecting something special about this young man. He's a very talented mountain climber. He's now pushing on as he breaks away here. Just won the Tour of Switzerland. But oddly enough, riders who do ride well in the Tour of Switzerland very rarely have a great Tour de France. Perhaps it's the proximity of the two races. Lutenberger, however, now testing the King of the Mountains leader, Richard Brink, who looks pretty cool at the minute. Udo Boltz is in this league group as well. So too, the strong newcomer, Jan Ulrich. Telecom have one man in the lead and two men here. They are doing themselves plenty of favours for the team race as well. Alano in a spot of bother, and I don't see the yellow jersey either. Alano has gone off to our right, and I think you know the Berzin has gone off as well. Escartine is 181. Rominger is hanging on grimly to the back of this group, which is being stirred up by Miguel Ingerain. No other. Injurain at the front, Lutenberger back in the pack. The gap is enough now to give Bjorn Aris the yellow jersey. Injurain trying to take control of a furs again, two days after he hit the wall at Les Arc. Well, we've come round the snow today, and Injurain hasn't got anything like the clothing on he had on his climb to Les Arc. No gloves either. And perhaps he's feeling that little bit better. Everybody had to feel sorry for Injurain at Les Arc. Nobody likes to see a champion struggle. Nobody had seen him really suffer previously. Further up the climb, Bjorn Aris, the next candidate for the hot seat. He heads up under two kilometres to go. His legs protected just to keep the chill off those leg muscles. The riders always worry about the likelihood of tendonitis and the kneecaps. Injurain, Lutenberger, but you know, Yellow has gone. He's not in this group at all. We didn't see him go, but he's gone. So Evgeny Berzin falling away from perhaps the top two or three places overall here. Luc Leblanc also trying to put in a little bit of a special ride on this climb and recover a bit. He's just gone clear of the group, in fact. Leblanc is second man on the slopes now as we head up into the town of Sestria. We're in Italy, don't forget, but it's not an Italian. There's only ever been Italian winners of the Tour de France here. Fausto Coppi, Claudio Chiapucci. Now they're going to see the champion of Denmark because Bjorn Aris is under one kilometre to go. It's the time that will matter. Although, frankly, I think he's got all the time he needs now because the yellow jersey has been dropped off the back of the chase group. Luc Leblanc is closing in pretty rapidly. Whether he'll get on, it's uh, debatable. What a courageous rider Luc Leblanc is. The French love him for it. He never lets anybody have a peaceful ride. If he's got half a chance, he'll go for it. And Injurain has been left to do all of the pacemaking over these last few kilometres. And that's why a rider like Leblanc has found the strength to jump around him and get clear. Rominger behind Injurain. He rides me, he reminds me a lot of Jupp Zutemelk, Tony Rominger. Tends to follow wheels rather than put in decisive attacks. Third place is Richard Verenck. Jan Ulrich. This rider has never seen the Tour de France, only on television. And look at him now. Bolts in a spot of bother, tagged onto the back, as is Escartine. Ulrich has gone too. They're almost on to Luc Leblanc, but here's the man who's won the day. He's led since the lower slopes of Mont Genevre. A climb which, by the way, was used in the Giro d'Italia this year as well. And now the Dane Bjorn Aris comes to the line for the stage victory. 
And Bjorn Lloris, last one to stay to the Tour de France at Albi in 1994, at Chalon-sur-Marne in 93, and now Sestrier in 96. Watch the clock. Luc Leblanc will get second place. And Leblanc, well, will he get second place? Because, in fact, Richard Varenk is closing in very quickly on him. Leblanc is just about flat out for the line. Yes, he will. Leblanc gets second place. The time saying he's 24 seconds down, about 26 seconds back to Varenk. And then comes Rominger, just pipping Indurain into the line. And then the rest off following. Udo Bolts being challenged by Federic Escar team. We are still waiting for the arrival of the Mayo Jean. And looking down the road there, it is not in sight. Oh, here he comes. Almost a minute has gone by as the Mayo Jean of Evgeny Berzin comes into sight. And Bjorn Aris can now wash his face and get ready for his yellow jersey because the Russian rider has lost it today to Bjorn Aris of Denmark. He's losing time, but maybe not enough time to cost him second place overall. As he comes up to the line, he is going to finish. Look at the time for the stage, one hour, ten minutes. <laughs> As Luc Leblanc gets second overall, Rhys Varenk, Rominger, Indurain and Bolts, the Mayo Jean today, uh, does finish 14th, a minute and 23 seconds back. And Bjorn Rhys is the new overall leader of an amazing Tour de France. Rhys now leading Berzin by 40 seconds, Rominger is third and Abraham Olano is fourth. Further down the list, Indurain climbing back, he's now up to eighth. And at last, the sun has discovered the Tour de France at the town which boasts 300 days a year of sunshine here in Gap. And as the riders make their way from Italy, there's no doubt who these people are going to support when Bjarne Ries comes into the finish. The race is 209 kilometres today, coming out of Turin, down to Gap, over the mountains. And we left Gary Imlach back at the start in Turin. And just 157 riders rolling away from Turin. The race hasn't been there for 30 years. And this a very sad sight. He's been yo-yoing off the back all day. Laurent Jalabert saying he has a fever, has abandoned the Tour de France. And that is a big disappointment for the French. But that is the way this year's tour is going. Big names are falling out, or in the case of Miguel Indurain, dropping back. And the happiness of the world's number one just a year ago when he won on Bastille Day and won the green jersey and finished fourth overall, nothing but a memory. This is Andrea Ferragato passing through our lenses here. It's been a battle all day between Eric Zorbel and Frédéric Moncassin for the points for the green jersey competition. Zorbel winning both of the spins so far. But now we have a small group here trying to slip away from the field. As we run down towards the finishing gap and the beauty of the Alps are now all around us. It's a beautiful, warm summer's day. There's where we are, approaching the climb. A little climb it is of the Col de la Sentinelle. And from that leading breakaway, Rolf Sorensen has gone. The opportunist Rolf Sorensen, he usually pops up and goes for gold at some stage. And Sorensen, remember, beat Neil Stevens, the Australian, for a stage win at Montpellier a couple of years ago. The top of the Col de la Sentinelle, it's uh, not a particularly high Col, it's only third category, uh, but what a springboard for the downhill sprint now. It's 10 kilometres straight down now into Gap, and then a steady, very steady drag up to the finishing line in the city. A city which they say gets so much sun you hardly ever see rain, and so it's proving today. Richard Varenk getting more points on that third category climb. He won the climb of the Col de Mont Ginevre today. The early roads today, very familiar to the riders who rode in the Tour of Italy this year. Now the chase down, if they can catch him, because everybody else has been swept up. Varenk led over the main field there, there's only this man staying away, but just watch Jones on this descent here. Uh, clipping the grass verges as he gives everything on the way down. The roads in the area, ideal for touring cyclists. Uh, not too many cars, in fact virtually none, and terrific uh, roads for touring, but Sorensen is taking just about every risk possible here. He just about braked hard enough to pull his bike round from that bend. They are closing in on him, oh, and are they closing in on him? 12 seconds is the gap, and it's the telecom team who are riding hard. Even Bjorn Aris of Telecom is up there now because, you know, they could go into the rest day tomorrow as leader on both the yellow and the green jersey competitions if they can get Zorbel into a high finish down at the end. Five kilometres from the finish. They're trying to chase down Rolf Sorensen and give Zorbel a shot at gold. 
Bruno Kengialta is out on the attack, trying to reach Ross Sorensen first. He's got no interest in the progress of German Telecom. The pink jersey of Onse, rather strangely being forced into a backseat role this year after dominating the race last year. But they've seen their team leader go out today, and I don't quite know how they will handle that, but Jalabert has gone. He's like Motorola now, the Onse, because they lost Motorola, lost Armstrong very early on in this year's Tour de France. Now, can they wheel in Rolf Sorensen? He has a habit of hanging on. He's a great lone break expert. He's under the one kilometre to go. Banner, and they're right there. They are almost on him now as Pat Yonker launches an attack straight off the front of the field as well. The Australian rider with the Dutch name. On the Spanish team, they're right close, but really, Rolf must not look around now. Just dig deep and hope he survives as the finishing line approaches. Rolf Sorens, and there he is on the right of our picture. The main field are closing in so very, very quickly now. Richard Varenk is still up there in the action. Laurent Dufault, I think it is, who's trying to end the hopes of Sorensen. He might get there. He sat up as he looks at the sprinters. They're right on him now. Abdu Jabarov is coming through as well, but Eric Zabel has got the front. This could be a perfect finish for Telecom. Eric Zabel, Abdu Jabarov as they come to line. Fedegato is tucked in there as well. Baldato too. Eric Zabel gets the victory, Abdu Japarov slaps his handlebars and that win will give a green jersey to Eric Zabel who has now got two wins in this year's Tour de France as he did last year when he won at Bordeaux and Charleroi, he's now won at nogent sur oise and Gap and this one I'm sure will give Zabel green. Fedegato third, Baldato fourth, and there it is. The green jersey on the eve of the rest day to Eric Zabel, and the yellow is on the shoulders of his teammate Bjorn Rees. Evgeny Berzin still second, and Rominger is third. Miguel Ingerain, no improvement today, no change at all overall on the rest day in the Alps. And so the riders now move on to stage number 11. The aching legs eased a little bit by the rest day in the Alps. The battle for the green jersey still centering between Zabel and Moncassin and Eric Zabel now building a lead over the Frenchman and Baldato there in third place. Zabel opening with a win at La Roche des Arnaud after 11 kilometres today. 28 degrees Celsius, that's a bit better. The westerly winds are blowing and it is warm and sunny. A few small hills and no really steep ones, they're called the Cabra. The second category climb at 47 kilometres has been won by Richard Varenk from Laurent Brochard and uh, Magnan getting the third place there. The riders are more or less staying nicely, tightly packed. But one name we've had to say goodbye to, the British rider Max Chandry has pulled out. And that is a shame, but uh, let's hope he has better luck at the upcoming Atlanta Olympic Games. Well, Madras at Motorola. Motorola really could do with a little result now as this breakaway has started to get itself clear of the field. This breakaway attacking on the climb of the Col de la Show. And the telecom team, led by the big rider Rolf Aldag, now uh, having to conduct the chase down, not just for the yellow, but for the points jersey as well. The rider on the far side of Madras there, he's in the championship of Spain colours, Fernando Ginez. He is the best rider in the breakaway, lying in 18th place overall, but 11 minutes and 4 seconds behind Bjorn Rees. So the job of the German telecom team there really is to keep this break under control, but not to worry over much if it gains a couple of minutes on the day, because there's nobody to damage the lead on the road to Valence yet of Bjorn Rees. Big test though for the yellow jersey, as always in the Tour de France, an attack here from Laurent Brochard, trying to break away from this rather unmanageable group of some 10 riders. And Brochard has ridden a very aggressive Tour de France so far and hasn't been rewarded with a good result at the end. He was the rider who went over the top of Jan Zverada in the stage finish that eventually led to the retirement of the Czech Republic rider. And Brochard back in the group. All the riders back together once more. They're thinned down to just eight men now amongst the riders being dropped to Tilly Bourguignon as we swing round and line up towards the finish in Valence. And again, another attack has gone so charging off the front there. That looks like it is uh, Jose Gonzalez, the Colombian rider for Kelme. 
It's very unusual to see a clubby rider in the kill in any case in a race that hasn't involved an uphill finish and he's actually caught them completely off guard that nobody I think expected the Colombian rider to attack. Well, Kel may come to this race every year, invariably go away with one stage win. They too lost their team leader uh, in Holland on that opening stage when Hernan Buena Hora uh, crashed. He went out of the tour having finished 10th last year and now there's a chance of some real consolation here. This will be a big surprise. Uh, Gonzalez uh, doesn't win any races outside of Colombia and now he's got his big chance. There's still no reaction from that group. The group behind is watching and waiting but they haven't come up at all yet. And he might well hang on here. It's a slight rise to the finish so perhaps the advantage will swing back to the Colombian. His nickname is Kepi. As he comes in towards the finishing line now, this is going to be a great result for Gonzalez. He's going to give Colombia a very, very rare finish indeed. I think we can just about call it a sprint finish. Brochard starts the reaction. Fernandez Ginez, he goes on to the right of our picture. And uh, Eli is also trying to get on the picture, but it's too late. Kepi Gonzalez gets the victory. In second place will be Fernandez Guinness, champion of Spain. There will be a time gap between them as the main field comes home here. The battle for the points continue. Baldato in the middle, and Eric Zabel is proving just too fast for everybody at the moment. And he gets some points as he finishes a little way down the field there. But well, there is the happy picture of today's stage of the Tour de France. Uh, Jose Kepi Gonzalez of Colombia and Kelme gets the victory in this 202 kilometre race in five hours and nine minutes. And overall, though, there's no change at all. Reese Berzin and Rominger. And the sun continues to shine as we now head towards the Ardèche.